This is the STS-119 crew interview with uh, Mission Specialist uh, Richard Arnold. Uh, your crewmates uh, and people who know you well refer to you by your nickname, Ricky. That's uh, right. Just for the record. Uh, Ricky, uh, give me uh, some sense of, of what it was that, that made you want to become an astronaut. Uh, I guess uh, as a kid growing up in Maryland, there were three things that really interested me. Uh, one was a uh, third baseman by the name of Brooks Robinson who played for the Orioles. Uh, two was the guys walking around on the moon. And uh, three was a guy named, a gentleman named uh, Jacques Cousteau. And I used to watch his show every Sunday. And um, I, I was really motivated by those three things. I quickly realized that uh, the Brooks Robinson route in life was, was, was not going to happen. Uh, through my antics in Little League, uh, but uh, I ended up taking the route where I wanted to go study marine science. Well, tell me more about that. How, how did you get into that? What, um, what, what was that like, the marine science thing? Well, that was a, uh, I, was for, I had a fortunate, fortunate series of experiences. Uh, one is uh, I ended up in graduate school at the University of Maryland, and they have an uh, environmental science center over on the eastern shore, uh, the Horn Point Environmental Lab. And I got in with a really good group of scientists there uh, on my advisory committee who also uh, really encouraged me to, to try some different things in the field when I, when I finished. Um, prior to that, I had actually worked as an uh, oceanographic technician at the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. And it was there I kind of got the bug for teaching. So uh, kind of had dueling interests there. I, I got to work with a lot of the incoming uh, midshipmen and uh, really enjoyed that and I also enjoyed the oceanography and at some point I decided you know, I can combine these two and, and do something really, really worthwhile. Ended up with a career in education. Tell me about what uh, your, your teaching experiences. What, what's that like to, to, to be able to, to, to impact kids and know that um, the things that you offer um, have, have made a difference? Um, it, it, teaching is uh, it, it's a it's a great profession. Um, uh, I, I taught school for 15 years, grades six through 12. Um, uh, it's a really difficult job. I don't know that I really started getting proficient at it until I'd been teaching for quite some time. Um, but uh, you know, you get to go in every day and uh, uh, deal and mentor kids mm -hmm. and, and work with kids and um, you know they're uh, they haven't yet determined what the, what what their life story is going to be and where they want to go and and to be able to uh, to uh, help them think about what the possibilities are and uh, and then to, you know, when you're teaching long enough and you get old enough you start seeing them realize a lot of their dreams and it's, it's a really, really rewarding thing to, to run into a kid somewhere, to get an email out of the blue and say, hey, I, I just finished medical school. Uh, or, you know, I just, uh, I just uh, got married and had a, you know, had a, had, we're getting ready to have a, our first child. Um, and, uh, you know, and I really appreciate the things you did when I was in seventh grade or when I was in eighth grade. And uh, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's a, it's a really powerful moment. It have there been many uh, instances where you found that you as the teacher have learned? Oh, every day. <laughs> T tell me about some of, some of that. Every day, you, well, you don't really realize how much you don't know until someone starts ask, ask, asking you. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, when you have uh, kids who are really interested in, in particularly being fortunate enough to teach science, um, which there's so many open-ended questions in science, and uh, Kids just ask questions that you just possibly can't have the answers to everything. If uh, if you're, you know, when you when you get to teach something that's really uh, open-ended, and uh, so early on, it was I'd be going home studying every night because of the the questions I couldn't answer. And uh, there's an old saying, that, you know, you don't really know something until you have to teach it. And the reason is because you have 20 to 30 people holding you accountable in every single classroom uh, for the knowledge. And so. Uh, that was a really exciting thing. One of the really exciting things for me, and in a selfish way, um, you know, it was a job where I just got paid to learn. And um, it's a lot of fun when you're working with a group of people and you're sitting there learning together. And um, it's one of the real rewards of the profession. You, you, you talked a little bit about um, uh, the marine science. Did, did your, your, 
your hometown where you grew up, did that play into your interest in, uh, in the water and, and yeah, marine that, life? That, that's a really good question. I had, I had two, I guess, early influences with that. One is uh, growing up so close to Chesapeake Bay and also uh, spending a lot of time out there uh, fishing and crabbing when I was a kid. And uh, I also had grandparents who lived down on the coast of Florida. And uh, we used to make the journey down there to visit them. And uh, it was down there, you know, first time I got to put a snorkel and uh, mask on and go look underwater. And it was, it was really exciting for a third, fourth, fourth grader. Well, what was your immediate feeling when you, when you, when you submerged and, you, and you, you, you were in that environment? I wasn't in a big hurry to, to come back up. <laughs> That was really exciting. Yeah. Can you can you recount um, some of the things you saw down there the first time, and, and how that impacted that you? It was a while ago. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I can actually because it was a it was a it was a pretty neat moment. Uh, there was an old jetty uh, that was used to kind of stabilize the beach, I assume, and um, you know you get down in the water and it was uh, I remember it being really quiet. And yet, there's this flurry of activity uh, around with all the the, the fish and the, the different sea life. And uh, I remember the first time uh, going along that jetty. Just there's a, just a nice sized barracuda hanging out, and we just kind of sat there and stared at each other for a while. And uh, it was a pretty neat experience. Pretty brave too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not very smart, but uh. okay. Uh, who or, or uh, what was it that made you realize the value of education in life? Um, you know, my parents definitely, uh, you know, from early on, I, in hindsight, I look back and they moved to a specific place because it had a good school system and uh, they were always really involved in my education and uh, really encouraged me a lot. Um, they always made it clear that uh, I'd be going to college when I graduated because that was from high school because that was an opportunity that neither of them had and uh, and the other was some of the teachers I had along the way who really made a big difference in uh, in making me who I am as a person. As far as the teachers, uh, what was it about them? Was it their teaching styles or was it uh, I mean was it the methods or, or just how did they how did they reach you and, and the other students? I think it's like anywhere else. Uh, it was the ones that uh, kids can tell who cares about them. And there were certain teachers. It wasn't so much what they were teaching. It was how they were uh, treating you as an individual and the fact that they showed they cared about you. It made a, made a huge difference. Okay. Uh, as an educator, um, you presumably believe in the notion that, that education can take you anywhere. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here, here we are, we're knocking on the door, you're about to go to space. Right, uh, right. So you're, you're a living, breathing example of that. Uh, how, do you, how would you hope that your example uh, impacts other kids? Well, if, if you look at our crew, we all come from a, a very diverse backgrounds, uh, different parts of the country. Uh, different experiences uh, professionally, uh, different family experiences, and uh, yet uh, the one thing we do have in common is, uh, you know, education was a really important part of of who we were growing up and, and even as adults. And uh, so, you know, those dreams are all out there to, for these kids to realize who are sitting in school today. And uh, you just got to pick what you want to do and, and work hard to get there. Okay. Uh, NASA. Um is is striving to um, inspire the next generation of space explorers. Um, how, how would you suggest NASA does that? What how how are, how is how's NASA doing in that endeavor? It, the way I like to think of it is, uh, you know, one of the things I think this agency does really well is they kind of stick a flag out in the future and say, here here here's where we're going. Um, you know, we, we want to go back to the moon and, and set up, uh, you know, long-term scientific outposts there. We want to, we want to go to Mars and, and, and s see what's going on there in terms of, uh, you know, geology and um, the history of the solar system. Um, so I think those national goals and international goals are, are, are really, really important. And uh, much like a you know, generation that was inspired to put people on the moon for the, for the first time, you know, there's kids in school today who are sitting there thinking about, well, you know, I'd really like to be a part of that. And uh, what they need to be thinking about is what part do they want to play? Uh, this is going to be a journey that is made one day, and uh, there's, there's going to be uh, people all over the world uh, making it happen. And so they just need to be thinking about what part, what part do I want to play? It's not just a handful of people doing it. It's thousands of people everywhere. 
You were selected as an astronaut candidate the, the year uh, after Columbia and the year right. before return to flight. Right. Um, what was it that uh, made you think that um, or feel that coming to NASA was still a, uh, uh, the right thing for you uh, during that un time of uncertainty? Well, um, you know, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've experienced some, some tragedies uh, in NASA th throughout the history of, of human, human space flight. Uh, but, you know, those are difficult, difficult lessons we learn as we go out and do things that have never been done before. So um, I'd actually just mailed my application in right before the accident happened. And uh, I remember, um, I remember watching it on the news with my, my uh, wife live. Uh, we were in a different time zone, so it was really late at night. And um, the, uh, you know, we looked at each other and said, you know, this is something that needs to be done. And um, we'll learn from the mistakes. Uh, we'll take those lessons and do the best we can to make sure it doesn't happen again. But that's no reason to, keep try to quit trying. Mm -hmm. What's it been like um, training with your crewmates for this mission? You've, you've developed relationships. Yeah. You've, you've, you've been able to kind of um, learn from some of the more experienced uh, uh, right. crew members. What, what's that been like? It's been, it's been a good time. Um, uh, I'm part of a great team, and it's not just uh, the crew. Uh, we have a great training team that's uh, getting, us ready to get ready, getting, re getting us ready for this mission. We're also... Uh, a great ground team that's going to help us pull off this mission and uh, I've just been really impressed by the, the quality of the people, um, the, uh, the camaraderie we've developed and uh, the sense of teamwork that we've developed to go, to go pull off a really difficult mission. And you mentioned the, the, the ground support personnel, um, they're an extension of, of the crew. Without them nothing's possible. Exactly. Uh, what is it like when you when you've gotten a chance to meet these people um, during your your uh, travels uh, for training to, to talk with them and, and kind of interact with them? What's that been like? That's that's one of the real uh, uh, real joys of going out uh, going out to the other centers and and going out and meeting some of these folks uh, because they uh, they they understand what they do really really well to a detail that we sitting here can't even begin to comprehend. You know they're 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 part of a mission that, the, that we're trying to pull off. Um, and they understand that there are the consequences of if they don't get their job right. I, I met a gentleman at, uh, down at Kennedy Space Center before one of the previous launches. And he's the guy who, who makes the, uh, the pumps that pump the fuel uh, for the main engines. And it's uh, something we've been concerned about since early on in the program. And I go up and said, talked to the guy and introduced myself and he said you've got nothing to worry about we're, we're taking good care of you guys and you tell them how much you appreciate it and we kind of take mutual pride in what the agency is able to pull off one of the things that you and your crew will do is to, to deliver uh, Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata to uh, ISS to become uh, JAXA's first long duration uh, uh, astronaut for ISS um, right it's a big deal for, for that agency uh, and, and for ISS as a whole What's it feel like to have a, a small part in, in reaching that milestone? Uh, it's really exciting. Um, one of my jobs uh, in the astronaut office before I was assigned was to, I was part of the team that uh, was helping get the, uh, the, Jap the GEM, mm -hmm. their experiment module, ready to fly on STS-124. So I know a lot of the folks over in Japan who've been working for a long time to, to, to see this day uh, come to fruition. And it's really exciting to, to, to be the guy delivering Koichi or the man, as they call him, uh, over in Japan, up into space. You, you also participated in, in uh, the uh, underwater um, 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 experiment uh, called NEMO. Correct. Um, but d tell me about that. Um, kind of explain, first of all, what it is for people who may not know. Right. Uh, and tell me, um, tell me what it was like. It's, uh, NEMO stands for, it's a joint uh, operation with uh, NASA and uh, NOAA. And uh, it's NASA Extreme Environment Mission Objectives. And uh, there's an underwater habitat off the coast of Key Largo in about 40-some uh, feet of water uh, called Aquarius. It's about the size of a bus, and it uh, houses six people. And um, NASA takes down uh, astronauts and engineers along with uh, crew from NOAA. And uh, we've been working on for, I was part of NEMO 13, so 13 missions thus far. 
developing techniques for setting up outposts on, uh, on the moon and Mars. Uh, one of the neat things about working underwater is you can use the buoyant effects of water to create uh, kind of an artificial gravity environment. So uh, they were able to weigh us out like we would walk on the moon and, um, and then have us do different tasks to help develop the next generation of spacesuits that, that folks are going to use for walking and working on the moon. And uh, it was one of the most interesting things about it when we were doing these tasks, it was uh, they were trying to get us to come up with different techniques from getting to point A to point B and to pick up a rock and to do really simple tasks here on Earth, but in one six gravity with this cumbersome suit, it's a little bit, uh, we do it differently. And um, if you go back and look at the kind of the footage that we filmed and the, the techniques we ended up preferring was the same thing the guys in Apollo were doing, you know, kind of bunny hopping across the surface and, uh, you know, ways you were bending down to pick up a rock. So they thought out a lot of, they came up with a lot of really good answers during the Apollo program about how we're going to live and work on the moon. Could you uh, summarize for me the, the main goals uh, of this mission, STS-119? Yeah, the, the, the main goal, well, there's two of them, and you alluded to one earlier, it's, uh, the, was getting Koichi up and bringing Sandy Magnus back home. Um, but the main hardware goal or hardware objective is we're taking up the S6 truss. We're going to install the truss and deploy the solar arrays to start providing more power for the uh, International Space Station. Okay. Tell me a little bit about um, the S6 truss. What, what, what is it? What's it for? Um, how is it going to change the station? It's a, uh, it looks like something uh, that was built by an erector set. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, we call it the backbone of the station. You have the kind of the living quarters, which are basically a hollow tube running down the length of the station. And then you have the structure called the truss that kind of runs perpendicular. And the truss provides a, a place to generate power and to put a lot of the hardware for cooling and, and, and power. Um, we're going to attach the last segment. Uh, the S6 is about the size of a school bus. Uh, we're going to attach it onto the end, and then we're going to deploy these pair of 240-foot, you know, have a 240-foot wingspan of, of solar arrays that uh, will provide the power needed to accommodate a six-person crew and to do the full science on the new labs, the Columbus and the GEM that we just installed uh, over the past year or so. And for this mission, uh, you are a mission specialist. That's correct. Um, what are some of your key uh, roles and responsibilities uh, as mission specialist? What, one of my key roles is uh, part of the EVA team. Uh, I'll be participating in, in three spacewalks, and then I'll be choreographing one of the other spacewalks from the flight deck of Discovery. Um, and that's uh, where we have four EVAs, and uh, we're, that's really the big focus of our mission. Um, a couple of other responsibilities I have. I'm going to be uh, responsible for the do operating the docking system when we go to dock with the uh, International Space Station. Steve Swanson and I will be doing that. And I also will be uh, responsible for getting all of our pictures back home. So we'll be counting on you for that. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah you'll know who to blame. <laughs> uh, how would you uh, characterize uh, the work, um, the job that the STS-126 crew did on the uh, starboard side? Uh, solar Alpha Rotary Joint and, and how, um, how it has impacted the relevance of, of your mission. Uh, they did an outstanding job. Uh, we have trained some of that task. It, is a, it, was the, it was not an easy task. They came up with some uh, great ideas really on the fly and, uh, and you know the data that's been coming back about how those joints have been performing is uh, showing us that they came up with some really good ideas. Uh, for us, um, having the ability to rotate the Sarge uh, more frequently, the solar alpha, re alpha rotary joint, um, means that when we attach those new pair of solar arrays, that it's going to be able to provide power, more effectively provide power to, to the station. So um, have being able to rotate that, rotate that joint uh, more frequently is a big deal. On flight day one, um, you and your crew will launch on board Discovery. You'll uh, check out and configure systems for your stay in space. Uh, then on flight day two, there's a, a limited inspection uh, of the, the uh, Discovery's uh, outside exterior. Um, right. Uh, tell me about that act activity. Um, can tell you, 
On flight day two, uh, Steve Swanson and I will be uh, downstairs in the mid deck checking out our, our EMUs, our spacewalking suits. Um, while we're doing that, uh, the rest of the crew basically will be part of the robotics team and they will be doing a survey of the wing leading edge and also the nose cap uh, just to see if we sustained any damage on, on ascent to get a first look at it um, to the reinforced carbon-carbon uh, panels on, on those two areas of the vehicle. Um, they're going to be busy all day doing that, and it's, uh, but it's really good to get that data back and find out we're, we're looking good. Okay. Then I know on the next day, um, um, it's going to be the first of uh, several very busy days for both uh, the crew on board Discovery and the crew on ISS. Uh, I know you just mentioned you, you and Steve Swanson will, be, uh, will come in near the end part of that uh, to operate the docking mechanism. That's right. Um, but uh, and just tell me about what some of the other activities are going to be for that day with, with rendezvous and docking. It's a really busy day. The rendezvous uh, team will be up uh, doing a series of burns um, to get us up to the International Space Station so we can catch up and dock with it. Uh, we kind of have to, there's a lot of reconfiguring that goes on uh, to, for, that, for that phase of flight. Uh, we are also busy downstairs getting all the stuff ready uh, because once we dock, you kind of hit the ground running and there's a lot of transfer that has to occur. We had to get all of our spacewalking gear over to the, to the uh, station. So um, it's going to be a really busy day um, leading up during an already really busy activity, which is, uh, which is actually flying and getting where you need to go. Then on flight day four, uh, the focus turns to S6 uh, and uh, getting it out of Discovery's uh, payload bay. There's some right. joint robotic work between the shuttle and ISS. Um, can you describe for me how um, you and your colleagues on orbit will get S6 out of Discovery's payload bay and, and to the point where it will rest overnight? Sure. Uh, we'll use the station, uh, space station arm, which we'll call the big arm, uh, to actually reach into the payload bay and, and pull the truss out. Um, but because the S6 is so far out on structure, the uh, robotic arm in that position can't reach around and put the uh, truss where it needs to be. So the big arm will, will hand the uh, truss back to the shuttle arm, and then the big arm is uh, mounted to this uh, almost like a train uh, carrier, like a sm small set of uh, rails that it will then move down to fur get further out on structure, and they will reach back, grab the truss, and get it into position so we can go ahead and park it uh, at the end of uh, w at the end of the truss. We, we don't like to think of things not not going as planned, but it happens. Um, w what options are at your disposal if, if for instance, uh, one of the arms doesn't work well, if it fails during that that procedure? Well, the, the big picture is. Uh, Particularly, the having the the big arm or the the station arm is is critical to getting the arm out, of, getting the S6 out of the payload bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, it's redundantly powered; it has two separate strings. Uh, and the odds of both of those failing on one day are are pretty slim. So we're pretty confident that getting it out of the payload bay is uh, is is not going to be an issue. Um, any other failures after that, the, the ground team will get really busy uh, coming up with a solution for us to, to get it where to get the truss segment to where it needs to be. Uh, the ambitious schedule continues the next day with the uh, first spacewalk of the mission, also the first uh, of your career. Right. Um, what, what's the anticipation like for you right now, sitting here? Well, I try to imagine what it's like when we're over at the neutral buoyancy lab, the large pool where we train our spacewalks. Uh, I've been pay paying a lot more attention to trying to imagine what it's going to look like and um, what it's going to feel like the first time you, uh, you come out the hatch. Um, but uh, I imagine that's one of those experiences I'll have to talk to you about after. Uh, the uh, feedback I get from other crew members who are going out for their first spacewalk is that when you first come out of the hatch, um, it's uh, pretty spectacular. Uh, and maybe a little disor disorienting. Um, and then you grab your first handrail and it's like you're right back in the pool. And you know where everything is and where you got to go and, uh, and it's, then you're really busy because you, you're on a sh short time frame with a lot of things to do and you kind of get focused and uh, you're just like working back in the pool at that point. EVA-1 is, is all about getting uh, S6 uh, right. installed. Right. Um, 
Uh, tell me about that activity. What, what's what's going to happen during that, that EVA with, with installing S6? It's going to be a lot like uh, backing a car into the garage. Uh, the, Steve Swanson and I will be out on the end of, uh, of the truss where we're going to attach this last segment. And um, John and uh, Kuichi will be flying the robotic arm and we'll kind of be giving them directions. You know, come on back a little to the right, a little to the left. And uh, they'll go ahead and dock it. And then we'll go around, rotate, and drive some bolts and attach it. And then we have a whole bunch of activities to follow on then to prepare for the solar array deploy. Okay, so S6 gets installed and, and you, you make uh, power and data connections. To, right. Okay, and then there's some other task in that, that EVA. Tell me what, what the rest of the story is for EVA-1. Yeah, once uh, S6 is installed, uh, then we actually go out onto S6 and um, we'll be basically, uh, you have these giant solar arrays which are folded up like an accordion in these blanket boxes. And uh, we got to get those blanket boxes, boxes, right now they're anchored down to structure for, for launch. Uh, we got to release them from structure, actually partially deploy uh, the boxes themselves and rotate them around because the r arrays are actually sitting next to each other side by side. And we kind of got to bring them out 180 out from each other. And uh, so we can, after we go back inside, we can follow up with the deploy. But it's all about getting ready for the deploy after we get it installed. Uh, what happens in the unlikely event that the solar array blanket boxes don't quite unfold? Uh, it, a lot depends on where we are time-wise. Um, we think that if things are going as planned, that we have uh, contingency procedures that we've trained for releasing the blanket boxes manually. Um, if there were some other reason we were slowed down uh, during EVA-1 and we couldn't get to it during EVA-1, then we'll come back out for EVA-2 and manually deploy the blanket boxes. Uh, if mission managers decide they, they uh, want to take a, a closer look at uh, Discovery's uh, exterior once you're docked, uh, right. you'll do what's called a focused inspection. Right. Um, that may or may not happen. You guys won't know that until you get there. Right. Um, if it doesn't happen, if they decide, no, everything looks good with the shuttle, tell me about what, what is planned for that particular day. Well, what we're hoping will happen is that we will have gotten everything done on EVA-1. Uh, and the blanket boxes are deployed and everything's ready to go to deploy the solar array and we'll actually be able to just deploy the so solar arrays a, a couple of days early and uh, that will be really exciting if we you know that early in the mission and we get a good deploy of the arrays and everything's up and running when that'll be a really good feeling at that point talk me through that process if, if you would and, and, and include kind of highlight um, who's going to be involved and, and just an over a big picture view of what's going to happen including the ground. Right, that's um, everyone's going to be involved. Um, we've seen these uh, deploys before uh, on, on television and um, the uh, entire crew, we actually just had a sim the other day where we we're doing this, the entire crew with the uh, ISS crew and shuttle crew with the exception of one shuttle crew member is on ISS around the robotics workstation because that's where we have all of our camera views and that's where the deploy command will be sent from. So that team is on ISS. You'll have uh, our pilot Tony Antonelli who will be uh, on shuttle um, helping us get some good pictures with the shuttle arm and also some of the shuttle cameras and you're gonna have a massive team on the ground who's gonna be watching the same video we're watching um, looking for for any problems. So when we, when we got the right thermal conditions, the sun's out, the arrays have gotten nice and warm, uh, we have really good camera views. Uh, John Phillips will, simple as this, hit the deploy on the computer uh, and we'll all be watching the arrays start to, start to unfold. And all of us have specific areas on the array that we're gonna be watching um, to make sure there's no problem with our little piece of the puzzle. Uh, same will be happening on the ground. And if any one of those three teams, the, the folks on the station, Tony on the shuttle, or the uh, folks on the ground see something they don't like, we'll send the abort command, we'll stop, gather ourselves, see what data we have, and then proceed from there. Uh, this uh, business of dealing with uh, solar array deploys has, has, has been kind of um, uh, dicey <laughs> here right. in the past. Uh, are there any updated uh, procedures um, just based on past issues with solar array deploys? Well, we've learned a lot. Um, one thing we've learned is that we're, we're not going to have to hopefully take this solar array back in and so create any problem. We just have to deploy it uh, and it'll stay deployed. Um, the 
couple of issues that we, we think we're, we've, we've gotten a handle on. One is to make sure the lighting is just right. So when we were dis discussing earlier, everyone has a specific thing to watch. Uh, but if you have the sun in your eyes or you have a shadow cast on something, it becomes very hard to see. So we're going to make sure we're deploying when the, the sun is just right and we have a, it's not going to be any way what we're looking at is obscured. Um, the second thing is um, we think that uh, the right thermal conditions make a, make a big difference. Uh, you've heard about the problem of stiction where the panels kind of that are supposed to unfold stick together. And our plan is if we see anything we don't like, um, we'll hit abort and we'll stop and just allow the thing to, to bake a little bit and let it warm up and we think that's enough to just release that stiction and allow the deploy to continue. Uh, on the second spacewalk of the mission, uh, Joe Acaba and Steve Swanson will, will sort of tour the truss. Uh, right. Uh, can, can you give me an idea of, of what work sites they'll be at and, and some of the things they'll be doing? Right. Well, as I said, on EVA-1 we're attaching the S-6, which will be out on the starboard side all the way. Well, they're going to go out to the P-6 uh, on the, op the exact opposite side of where we've done our work on EVA-1. And they're going to do some. Uh, they're going to prep, prep some batteries uh, for uh, the next mission, STS-127. Those guys have uh, some battery chains out. They're going to do. And we're going to do some prep work to make their job a little bit easier. Um, they have some fluid lines. They're going to move around uh, out on the P side, on the port side. They then have uh, on both the port and the starboard side. They have these payload attachment systems that need to be deployed. Um, where you can put an experiment or something and one of them will be a powered attachment system and the other one will not. But it gives you a, a location to attach uh, payloads out in space for, for experiments and what have you. Uh, assuming um, S6 gets installed and deployed and everything is fine with that, you'll move on to uh, uh, some other hardware on EVA3. Uh, you'll be the, the lead EV on that one. Yeah, right, uh, right. Tell, tell me about what, what, what you'll do uh, on that EVA. Again, we're doing uh, some, some prep work for the next mission. Uh, the first task uh, right, out of the, right out of the hatch is to get Joe on the uh, robotic arm. And uh, we have these uh, CETA carts. We're kind of, uh, they're, they're crew and equipment transfer uh, vehicles. They're, they're like little train cars that ride up and down the truss. And, uh, we need to move one from one side uh, of the station to the other. So Joe gets a really exciting ride on the robotic arm. He gets to grab this thing and we we'll go around. I'll, I'll translate along and the arm will put him back on the other side and we'll mount it back on the track on, on the other side where it needs to be. Uh, following that, uh, Joe has some, uh, some electrical connections and uh, work that he's going to do out on the starboard uh, side. Uh, I'll be getting on the arm and riding down to uh, Dexter and uh, doing a few tasks there. There's some MLI covers and a few other things that need to be tweaked with Dexter. Uh, and then uh, from there, um, much like uh, 126 did, we're going to lubricate the, uh, the latching end effector of the station robotic arm. Where there's been, there's, these things grapple by using a set of cables that are snares and they are able to close snares and attach onto a pin and that's how they're able to pick up big payloads and move them around. Well the snares are getting a little gummed up so uh, we're going to try to clean them and, and make them operate a little bit better. Okay. And you mentioned Dexter just, just for informational purposes. Is that, uh, can you explain what Dexter is? Dexter is this really complicated robot built by our, our Canadian partners that uh, is a a, a machine that is able to do a lot of the work that I'm able to do. It's able to move around, drive bolts, change out ORUs. It, uh, it's a pretty good size uh, robotic, uh, robotic structure, robotic arm, but um, that's able to do a lot more fine kind of uh, work around the station than our current robotic arms are able to do. And um can I give us an overview, if you would, um, of, of what's going to happen on the fourth and final scheduled uh, EVA of the mission? There's a couple tasks that are going to happen. Uh, one of which is uh, we've noticed one of the panels uh, on uh, our radiators, which help us basically release heat out into space. Mm -hmm. One of those panels has begun to peel back, and we don't really uh, yet have an understanding of what that means, you know, what, it, how, how it was caused and, and how it's impacting our ability to, to get uh, heat out into space or to get rid of excess heat off the station. So um, 
Steve Swanson and I will actually come out of the hatch. He'll go um, forward on the station. He's going to go install a, a GPS antenna on the Japanese module. Um, and I'm going to head aft and uh, get in a, a foot restraint and take some infrared thermal images of both the radiators uh, to see if we can get some data that helps us understand uh, what's going on with the radiators and, and has this panel peeling back, uh, how's that affecting us. Um, I'll then also get some still images of both the radiators and if I have some time I hopefully will get some really good images of the entire back side of the, of the station. After your work on ISS is done, you and your crew will eventually depart. Um, right. As you're pulling away from the station, you'll get a chance to, to get your first big picture view uh, of, of the station with a fully built out truss, solar right. arrays all, all there. Right. Um, how do you feel knowing that, 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 that the contribution that, 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 you've, that you've, you've, you've been part of is going to help the station do more uh, with more people uh, in the future? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question um, because uh, when you when you back away from the station and every crew has uh, seen this, it's taken up a major piece of hardware. Your, your not only your work but the ground team and the folks who actually built this hardware, some of which was built ten years ago, and the engineers who designed it, who was designed even before you know even longer. Um, there's a whole group of people who are kind of realizing uh, a, a, a life's work uh, there. So that's going to be kind of thrilling to know that, uh, uh, you know, that entire team is going to be sitting there saying, hey, you know, I, I had a part in this. Um, I think uh, for, for us looking at it, it's going to be kind of nice to see the station as it will ultimately, I mean, we're, we're kind of getting close to finish. It's going to be 90 some percent complete. And as you said, the, it'll be symmetrical. There'll be two pairs of arrays on either side. Um, and uh, and I'm looking forward to to get some good good footage of that fly around and uh, coming back and sharing it with the folks on the ground.